The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for coming out on a beautiful fall day to hear about a dead language. Um, but the book I'm reviewing, so yeah, so my name is Hans Mueller. There are two more names. My parents actually christened me Hans Dash Friedrich Otto Mueller. Uh, and that, I, I received that name on November 14, 1959 in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, they did not anticipate the difficulties that name would uh, incur for somebody in the suburbs of Milwaukee. But like a boy named Sue, I became stronger. Uh, in Latin, I translated as Johannes Friedericus. Ah, there's, a, there's also a microphone. It's not helping. Perhaps I need to lean forward. Is that better? Can, a little bit. How's that? Oh, OK. All right. Uh, so Johannes Friedericus Molinarius uh, is the Latin version of the name. In fact, Mueller derives from the Latin Molinarius, as does Molinari, Meunier, uh, Molinero, Miller, and other such uh, names for people who, whose ancestors once upon a time ground grain. and. Um, I will, I think, talk about my own adventures with the Latin language and my own decisions to study the classics at some point, but I'm going to begin with Living with a Dead Language, My Romance with Latin, the book I was asked to review by Ann Patty, published in 2016 by Viking Press. And uh, how many, has anybody read this book? One person. Extra credit for doing your homework. <laughs> so for you, uh, what I'm about to say will probably be redundant. But for others, um, perhaps an enticement to read an engaging and lively book that explains not just her own uh, romance with the language, why she decided to uh, begin studying it, but also really reveals a lot about who her own life and uh, how she came to the and her uh, even longer standing romance with words and the intellectual life. And so I think uh, everybody's history is interesting. Hers is especially interesting. Uh, somebody who grew up in. Um, California and made her way east eventually after getting an undergraduate degree at Berkeley. And she did not study Latin because her mother wanted her to study Latin, so she avoided that particular topic. Uh, she did not have the greatest respect for her mother's career choice because she chose to stay home. And her mother had gone to uh, Catholic schools and studied uh, Latin, and uh, Ann Patty decided that she would then study French. And that would be her language. And uh, she also had set her uh, sights on a more independent career. Uh, and she found that career and was very successful in publishing in New York City, uh, where she founded her own imprint, the Poseidon Press, and uh, was quite successful publishing such bestsellers as um, The Life of Pi. And, um, went through a couple of marriages, uh, had a child, has a daughter, uh, various lovers, and uh, things were going rather swimmingly in New York City, but she, in, after the crash of 2008, she lost her job and uh, found herself in, uh, her, on her country estate in Rhinebeck, New York, with a lot of time on her hands. And also, she had to confront a, a life crisis of cancer, very invasive form with I forget how many um, active nodes. But she 
went, she successfully weathered that health crisis. She found Zen Buddhism, and she also uh, discovered Latin, something that she had avoided for much of her life, but decided that she wanted to study, and uh, it was something that would give her life some discipline and structure, too, in Rhinebeck as she put her life and career back together. And it was interesting for me as, excuse me, as an instructor of, of Latin, to, it's always interesting to know why people come to the study of a dead language. It's not intuitively obvious why anybody should want to study words no longer used actively by um, any living community. I mean, Latin does have its uses uh, still in the Vatican. Official pronouncements are written and promulgated in this word. When Pope Benedict resigned, he did so in Latin. It took, it took the reporters a moment to figure out that he had done so. Uh, and there are good reasons in a, for an institution as long standing as the Catholic Church to continue to use a language whose vocabulary remains fixed. Um, so you can set down the doctrines in words that will not change their meaning as quickly as words in our own um, in current English. Those words are likely to continue shifting in meaning as long as English remains a living language. And so um, there, there was a time when Latin also served as a spoken language, actually up and through the 19th century among the educated in uh, universities in Europe. But for practical purposes, Latin is no longer a living language. And there are small groups of people who continue to use Latin actively, too, here in the United States also. Abroad, the Finnish News Service still publishes daily news bulletins in Latin. So I mentioned these exceptions to the rules. But still, most people think of Latin as a language that is no longer in use. On the other hand, Anybody who speaks English, anybody who speaks Spanish or Italian or French or Rado Romance or Romanian or any of the other many dialects of the Latin languages, most European languages, they have a huge inheritance, including English, a Germanic language. We have a huge inheritance from uh, Latin. Over 70% of our vocabulary does derive from this ancient language. And so every time we use English, we're using Latin. And so in that respect, it does live on today and on every, probably on the tongues of every person in this room when you pronounce vocabulary from Latin. But well, that's fine. You can study vocabulary. Why actually study the grammar, the syntax, the morphology, all of these difficult things that go into uh, reading a language in the original? Well, Ann Patty does a very good job of documenting her rationale. So we left her on her uh, country estate in Rhinebeck. Um, without, a, without uh, having lost her job, and she's decided to, uh, that she wants to pursue the Latin language. And um, she first writes to uh, a professor at Bard College, James Rahm, uh, who we only learn later in the book the identity of this person, so as a um, as a Latin instructor at Union College, another liberal arts college, I was immediately curious, who is this guy who turned her down? <laughs> Not knowing that she's going to publish a book. <laughs> that, that poor fellow. <laughs> so, but of course, I, I wanted to know who it was. But she reveals it later, because she does take a class from him later. But he says, no, he finds that auditors are not good student, so he turns her down. Bard was very close to her in Rhinebeck, so she then turns to Vassar, and uh, there is a young visiting assistant professor who is willing to take her in as an auditor, Curtis Dozier. And she begins a study of Latin, and she documents very well and uh, eloquently how um, you know, the nervousness of somebody who's in her mid to late 50s coming to class every day, showing up as the first person in the room, uh, wondering 
you know, how she's going to perform against the younger and more nimble minds of the adoles late adolescents who are around her. She has humorous descriptions of her fellow students. She gives them all nicknames. So, you know, describes their tattoos and hairstyles and takes interest, close interest in whether, who's dating whom. There's, there's um, one f young man whom she describes as having bedroom eyes and she f finds him attractive and he's with one girl and he's with another one, that sort of thing. Um, so you get, it's, it's a student's eye view. And she also describes how she has to work, how hard she has to work memorizing the vocabulary, going over the practice sentences, translating. And, um, but she really enjoys it. And so, but as she's describing these things in detail, actually taking us through the lessons and the various um, Part, verbs and nouns that she's learning and adjectives. She also interweaves this narrative with descriptions of various aspects of her life, in a, not in a chronological way. So I will, would have trouble trying to reconstruct her life from these reflective narratives. The, the narrative of her studies of Latin that's chronological, but then the reflections going back to different parts of her life, to childhood, to adolescence, to her college days, to various parts of her career, that's more occasioned by what's going on in the Latin class. And so while we're reading about her um, journey into the Latin language, we're also learning about her life and how the discipline of the study having structure to her life is also helping her to reflect on um, you know, what, how she's rebuilding her career, which she does from Rhinebeck. And also, uh, she reflects on her relationship with her mother, who was deceased. Um, we learn for, that her mother was, after raising the children and they departed uh, from the house, she lost purpose. and. Uh, be, became an alcoholic or and eventually died early at 66 and then and Patty wonders you know about the path, the different paths the path her mother took versus her own and uh, why her mother always had encouraged her to learn Latin and whether or not if um, she had, had studied Latin a little earlier, they would have had more to talk about in that regard. So um, you really do get an insight into um, her personally. I should keep track of the time. Um, and uh, so we go through beginning Latin. That's one year. But she continues with her studies of Latin. Oh, we also learned about her. Well, we'll get to that. Um, into a second year. And in the second year, uh, she, in intermediate Latin, she begins study of a first real author, Catullus, who was a love poet. Uh, I did not, so most of you have studied Latin at some point, or many of you. So Catullus, uh, may I ask what, which author you read in, which authors you've read? You can just call them out. Virgil. Ovid. Ovid. Caesar. The Aeneid, Caesar. Marcus Tullius Cicero. Marcus Tullius Cicero, okay. All solid authors. Um, Ver so, Marcus Tullius Cicero, Roman politician, Julius Caesar, politician, general and priest, uh, who, whose Gallic commentaries of the Gallic War are, there's not a lot of love in them. Uh, but it common, it's more common, I think, at the uh, college level than the high school level to use Catullus, a poet from the first century BC, to um, ease students into genuine Latin, um, well, in this case, poetry. The thing about Catullus, too, is he's very colloquial, and poems have the advantage uh, when one first takes up real Latin. Uh, has the advantage of being, poems have the advantage of being short. Uh, so even if it takes a long time to read one poem, uh, you can keep track of the whole thing, as opposed to a speech by Cicero. 
where by the time you know, reading along at the rate of one, even at one paragraph a day, uh, it's easy enough to lose track of the trajectory of the argument. I'm sure that will be very different tonight when <laughs> candidates Clinton and Trump debate because I'm sure their well-structured rhetoric, well, actually, we know at least on one side the rhetoric will probably be well-structured and well-prepared, um, and I'm not saying which, um, because I'm not political here today, according to my instructions. Um, so, but it's, poems are shorter, and so it's easy to keep track of. And Catullus has the advantage, too, of being immediate and dealing with love affairs or insulting people. Much of his, many, many of his poems are obscene, too, and use vocabulary that is, I don't know. I wonder whether we'll continue to use Catullus for intermediate Latin now that um, we have moved into more sensitive times because of its harsh kind of obscenities in terms of sexual language. But um, anyway, she re begins reading some of this poetry, and we learn that her, um, it's not her husband, the man she lives with, she calls him um, various things. She laments the fact that she does not have a proper term for somebody because she doesn't want to get married anymore, having been through a couple of marriages. Um, but the, her, she doesn't like, want to call him a partner, her lover. Um, but anyway, his name's George. I'll call him George. Um, they, there's, a, there's one poem by Catullus where there's a sparrow, and Catullus describes how the sparrow jumps on his uh, lover's lap. Her, he calls her Lesbia, it's just a poetic name. So the sparrow jumps on Lesbia's lap, and in the Renaissance there was a scholar whose theory was that this sparrow represents a penis. And um, then this theory becomes less popular in the uh, 19th and 20th centuries, but then was revived again uh, more recently, and has become more popular, but I found it, there's a description of the class discussing these interpretations, mm -hmm. and um, Anne Patty was really the only one who found it um, convincing, and she seemed to, she described shocking her fellow students who, who were more prudish than she. But then in, she goes home and shares the um, poem with George, and he, he, a man of uh, generally few words, who's an arborist and goes hiking a lot in the mountains near Rhinebeck, and um, they have a nice discussion of the poem and its meanings, and they share a night of love afterwards, inspired by Latin love poetry. Now, these are not the kinds of insights I generally actually I get or I would even ever inquire into with my own students. So I found it, but but this published in a book, and so it was open to all to read. But at, you know, we all have personal lives, and so it takes great courage, I think, to share the details, intimate details of you know, the interactions of reading literature and experiencing life and sharing disappointments and disease and um, uh, failed and not completely successful, but then you know, trying to repair relationships. And, um, and then see how somebody who is actively intellectually engaged actually um, interweaves study and discipline and learning about uh, learning uh, alien vocabulary and a foreign culture with in, how weave, oops, weaves that all together in her personal life. And then is willing to put it into um, readable prose and share it with the world. Um, I, don't know, I don't think probably most people aren't willing 
to do that. And so I think that um, not only do classicists owe her a debt of gratitude for this kind of engagement, but anybody who reads her book and is inspired by it. But anyway, so now we're in intermediate Latin. She's reading Catullus. Um, it's having an effect on her personal life. It's improving her love life. Um, and uh, she continues with her studies. And um, she uh, studies such she, the next class looks at lyric poetry, so not just Catullus, but also Horace and Propertius, who's a Latin love elegist. And the, Horace and Propertius are more challenging poets than Catullus. Why? Because they are, their, their poetry is often more learned with uh, more convoluted syntax, more difficult meters, uh, but still engaging uh, poets who have much to uh, share. And then also she reads Ovid and Virgil and eventually gets to Lucretius. Um, and she has one class in particular where uh, they read Lucretius on atheism and uh, Virgil's description of the afterlife in the sixth book of the Aeneid. And she juxtaposes these two readings. And she herself, we learn, uh, is somebody who's, um, well, her mother was a Catholic, was a lapsed Catholic, her father a Presbyterian. Uh, she was sent for confirmation class to a Lutheran church. As soon as she uh, finished confirmation, had her first communion, she quit and was, uh, as she describes it, a, an avowed atheist, even though that is not the polite thing to be, because most people who do not care to join a, an organized religion will say, for politeness sake, oh, I'm not an atheist, I'm agnostic. Uh, because then at least you say, well, I'm not going to say you're wrong, but I don't buy it. Um, but she says she's somebody who in her own life want, always felt it was important. Can you still hear me? because I realize I'm leaning back from the lectern. Um, uh, she was somebody who always wanted to state what she thought, and she was absolutely convinced that there was no um, deity. Uh, so you know, for her, then, reading these two divergent approaches, Lucretius, who has this philosophical atomistic approach to the organization of the universe versus uh, Virgil with his much more traditional pagan, and by the word pagan, I mean pre-Christian classical Roman religious point of view, where the world is populated by divinities and divine spirits, uh, spirits multitude forces. Um, they were an interesting balance. And then she weaves in the story of her own experiences with yoga and Zen Buddhism while, um, you know, while she was sick with chemo, undergoing uh, chemotherapy. And um, so the sorts of spiritual sustenance available to her as somebody who, who did not have the traditional beliefs of an organized monotheism. Um, so again, we see that as she's, and so this journey is actually taking us through more than a few years because she completes the equivalent of an undergraduate major in Latin over, um, a, I mean, as a, uh, somebody who teaches history from time to time, I would have, yeah, I would have really liked to have a chronology so I could put it all straight. If I went back, I could try and maybe work one out on, on my own. But um, it's, it seems to me it's about four or five years. And um, she, also, in addition to reading a, a, lots of, a lot of poetry, she also takes a class from uh, a Roman historian at Vassar uh, who teaches a course on Latin inscriptions. So many, many of the original documents that we possess from Rome were carved on stone or set on bronze tablets. And uh, unlike the, the literary authors, um, we still have access to the inscriptions uh, provide us with uh, ancient voices more immediately because whatever they wrote down on that stone, we're reading the, those words uh, directly as opposed to trying to sift through thousands of years of errors that crept in through copying things out word by word longhand. Uh, 
in monasteries. Um, and she uh, describes, uh, yeah, again, an interesting class where every student had received a different inscription to deal with, and um, she did well in that class too. Um, but then where does she go after the conclusion of her equivalent to an undergraduate major? Just keep taking classes forever? Uh, she is now, there's, I did mention there are uh, some people who like to speak Latin and there are different groups and she considered going to uh, Kentucky. Uh, there's a, uh, two, fa two professors at the University of Kentucky, Terrence Thunberg and um, Melina, oh shoot, something Markovic, I forget. It. Ah, her name escapes me at the moment, but, um, and this is on television. I hope they never see this. Um, so, <laughs> should have written it down. Um, so, at the University of Kentucky, they'll do week long summer sessions, very popular. Uh, there's another group, though. There's also um, a, um, a Latinist formerly at the Vatican named Reginald Foster. He's from my own hometown of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And he was the Pope's Latinist for many years. And in the summertime, he used to run classes f and for free. Anybody who wanted to could take his classes and um, you know, six hours a day speaking Latin and uh, reading ancient, reading Latin texts and at the various in archaeological sites of Rome. And he was famous among Latinists, so among a couple hundred people, um, for conducting these classes. He's also famous for wearing a uh, polyester blue jogging suit. He would buy a new one from J.C. Penney every year. Um, and According to a former colleague of mine at the University of Florida who took several classes from uh, Reginald Foster, when uh, the Vatican, so he was, a senior, he was especially a senior Latinist for Pope uh, John Paul, and uh, when they were rewriting the dress code for the Vatican, he wrote a clause in there in Latin that, um, you know, to wear proper attire vestments or a blue jogging suit. <laughs> so that's not in the book, but that's what my colleague Jennifer Rea from the University of Florida told me. Um, and I trust her. Uh, she's also from Milwaukee. Um, but Father uh, Foster grew old. He had to retire. And one of his former students, Jason Petticone, who was completing a PhD at the time at Princeton University, helped to finish out the course in Rome one summer and uh, eventually established a uh, business on the basis of Reginald Foster's original summer Latin program. This is called the Paideia Institute and based in New York City. And um, he began with summer seminars speaking Latin in Rome, but it's expanded to taking high school students to different sites. They have Caesar in Gaul, for example, uh, for high school teachers, and also um, so elementary, intermediate, senior Latin speakers. They also have events in New York City, and he's becoming, it's become an enterprise in itself for uh, travel to classical lands looking at uh, um, ancient sites and reading and speaking Latin, not only Latin, but also Greek. And so you can do um, ancient Greek in Athens and learn to speak it with an emphasis on uh, oral competency in the language. And so after um, her literary studies in the traditional way at Vassar and somewhat at Bard, she moved on to some of these 
Paideia institutes, and including in, Af in uh, Rome and in New York City, and she joined a tutoring program helping uh, primarily Spanish-speaking students after school once a week uh, learn Latin, and uh, she's continued to be active as of 2016 when this book appeared. Uh, the book concludes with uh, a box she receives, or a package she receives from her brother, uh, who, and when she opens it, she discovers a medal that her mother won for a Latin contest in, I think it's Indiana, when she was a child. And so, so it was an interesting way to conclude, or a touching way, really, to conclude the book with this, she receives possession after all of these studies of her mother's Latin medal. And um, so this journey is not just about um, connecting with her love of words, about which I didn't say enough, but also, um, and her love of language, but also with the ideas of another time and culture, the trajectory of her whole life, and um, you know, missed opportunities in the relationship with her mother and um, through the language that her mother had wanted her to study, but that she neglected until um, she was an adult and her mother was dead. Um, and so it's a, it's a very personal journey into Latin, but I think it's a journey that has uh, relevance for um, all of us at, you know, at any stage of life, as somebody who has, well, my father was a businessman. He sold office furniture. And when I told him um, that I wanted to, originally I wanted to study philosophy, he said, in other words, you want to be a bum. <laughs> and, He had a point. Uh, <laughs> I, d I wanted a job where I could continue to read and learn things. And um, is that so bad? Well, yes, if it requires other people paying high taxes, I suppose. But, um, but I think that, um, you, know, you know, we all, all, everyone has to make a living, but all of us as human beings continue to learn and have an interest in the world. And uh, I think that she shows the way how at any age, uh, at different stages in the face of calamity, people can continue to learn and just follow whatever is interesting to them, wherever it may go. It may not be la the Latin language for many people. And she describes especially the difficulties that you know, face the late middle-aged brain. Um, when, and they are, I better check the watch here, they are challenging. Uh, I continue to try to learn new languages, and I know I can't learn them as quickly as I once did. Uh, when I was, um, I first finished my PhD, my wife and I went to Munich, Germany with uh, three small daughters, and our fourth was born there, but I always remember the it, how interesting it was to see the three girls pick up German. So the older two would learn individual words, but the youngest, who was about four and a half, she would just listen to people on the street and imitate them and make fun of them, and just, just the sounds of the whole sentences. And gradually, those, those sounds, those long strings of me meaningless sounds making fun of people would become uh, evolved into words and whole sentences, where, as opposed to the other two who had to learn the words individually. And of course, as we get older, then we um, have to rely on other tricks. So um, for example, um, if I can use an analogy, when I was a young when I was a boy, and my father's my soccer coach, he told me the problem with you is not only are you slow, you're clumsy. So you have to learn how to foul. And so what you do is you compensate for, I'm not proud of that, but so 
But you compensate for the lack of skill by using other tricks. And so for an older brain, um, one of the tricks is, so for a lack of elasticity in whatever's going on in the brain with the neurons and synapses, there is a, there's a shortcut to language called syntax and grammar. So you learn the rules. So uh, for younger learners of language, oftentimes, it, you know, the idea is, oh, don't use grammar translation methods because um, you know, you know, people need to learn the, the language naturally. But of course, if you're older, um, you don't want to spend the time it takes to learn a language naturally. I don't want to be, you know, go from age zero to seven learning the language. I want to you know, begin reading it after a semester or two, one year. And if the goal is to read and not to ask for a Coca-Cola or a cup of coffee um, in the language. And so, so for classical languages, Latin and Greek, or any, other, any language you prefer to read than um, speak or converse in, it's useful to learn the, the rules of the language and then some model sentences and vocabulary, and then you can expand on that basis. And it is a, it may not be the most efficient way to becoming fluent, but it is a way to get into sophisticated language rapidly and effectively. So after a year of Latin, a student is reading sophisticated poetry written by an educated uh, man for an educated audience, as opposed to um, something made up and inauthentic. Uh, so there are advantages to studying the old grammar translation method. Um, also recorded on television, also could get me in trouble. Um, but it depends on what one's goals are. There are also uh, people today who, as I mentioned, ad uh, approach Latin as a living language and swear by that method. There are many paths to Latin, and uh, those who are interested can find their own path, whether it's self-instruction with a Teach Yourself Latin book, uh, local schools. So if anyone here were interested in Latin, uh, uh, there, so I teach at Union College, so I know that the options there best. There, we have the Union College Academy for Lifelong Learning. It's called UCall. Uh, I think it's about sixty dollars a year. One signs up, and they have a number of courses on offer designed specifically for um, the local community, uh, with no tests and no um, assignments, no grades. Uh, and they cost about, in addition to the initial $60 fee, $25 a piece. However, um, if one signs up for this program, one can also take uh, up, you know, audit one class a term at Union, a regular class with regular faculty who um, do assign readings and offer quizzes, though auditors generally don't have to take them. And I have had uh, auditors from the local community sign up for my class. We offer beginning Latin every year. We offer beginning ancient Greek every year. And so it is an, that, that is a local avenue um, for any of you if you were interested in Latin or Greek or other subjects, um, since they are on offer at Union as well. And I had a retired lawyer take a couple of courses in ancient upper level ancient Greek from me a few years ago. Um, and he, it was, it's really helpful, I think, sometimes to have um, somebody in the room who takes the, the subject seriously, shows up on time, <laughs> does his homework. I mean, I always have the best translation, but he has one. And so I personally would encourage it. Um, I also, you know, DVDs. Um, I do have the course in Greek and a uh, course on beginning Latin with the great course is also one on ancient Greek. Um, but there are also other self-study methods available out there. I'm sure, uh, I think Skidmore College locally has um, opportunities for the local community to audit classes too. I'm not sure about their rules. Unfortunately, classics no longer exists at the um, 
University at Albany. I think they do offer beginning Latin from time to time, but they no longer have a full classics program. Uh, I could go on and talk, and I frequently do because I know how to fill time, but I think I will pause here for questions, uh, comments, see what you're interested in discussing. Yes? Could it be uh, Ann Taddy was trying to prove, maybe as a thrust of her book, that Latin really is not a dead language, that it's used in everyday language? No, I think that's a good point. So she is pointing, Living with a Dead Language by Romance with Latin, one uses, it's not, I, don't, I wouldn't describe the romance as necrophilia. I think <laughs> her, the language, is alive, and um, she really brings that out with her deep and personal engagement with it. Yes. Uh, today's subject, how does that fit in with Alan Bloom's The Closing of the American Mind? Uh, <clears throat> how does this fit in with it? Well, I would say that uh, Ann Patty, somebody who's dedicated her life to publishing and um, you know, more humanistic endeavors. She is somebody who's worked on opening minds, and um, <clears throat> as far as the closing of the American mind, you know, there is a general trend towards what is perceived as more practical, less funding for what is perceived as um, frivolous, so arts and humanities. But I think that uh, so I think she works against it. I'm not exactly sure. You're, are you asking me to comment on my opinion on how closed the minds are these days, or the book? Yeah, I, I mean, I remember when it first came out. I haven't looked at it in years. Um, so you know, there's the argument: our students is interested in the less practical, so I, I like to joke around that I teach Greek and Latin because not everybody can study such impractical things as fluid dynamics or um, you know, organic bo or bonds in organic chemistry. Um, somebody has to concentrate on the words, but that's just, I'm being facetious. Uh, and I think though that there's tremendous pressure. I've had, we had a student recently in Classics. He had all the courses he needed for classics major and all the courses he needed for his engineering major. All he needed to do is, like, he had plenty of room in his schedule. It was the first ever we were going to have a combination engineering classics. But his parents were so worried that even having the word classics on his diploma as a double major would diminish the value of his engineering degree, so they refused to let him complete the classics degree. So the students are under tremendous pressure. I have another student who was taking ancient Greek from me a couple years ago. He's an economics major, very smart young man. Um, and he wanted to continue with ancient Greek, but before he could continue with ancient Greek, he had to call his father and ask him whether he had permission. So these students are much more um, connected to their parents than I ever was. So I left home in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I chose Brown University initially because it was the farthest thing, farthest school I got into away from Milwaukee. And it was cost an incredible fortune to talk on the phone. So I, yeah, I talked to my parents every couple, once every couple of weeks. I wrote a couple letters home by hand. Um, these kids are texting the parents the results of their quiz grades, um, asking permission. Um, my father didn't find out I was going to ruin my life and become a bum until after I got home from winter vacation. <laughs> Drop the bombshell. I don't want to be a chemistry major. <laughs> I want to major in philosophy, precipitating a family crisis. Um, so. Yeah, you know, it's but we live in different times too. So I was able to drop out of Brown University, and um, so I tell my parents, "Well, I'll put myself through school." I could do that because at that time it cost about I, I, it was it was like less than three hundred dollars a semester, and I could take all the classes I wanted. So I just got a part-time job, got an apartment. You know, my guarded. I became a Pinkerton security service man, guarded factories, and I could take whatever I wanted. And I could afford to do it and eat a lot of lentil soup. Um, but 
I don't think student, I don't think young people can do that today anymore because even at SUNY Albany, you would be looking at um, twenty thousand dollars for the year. So, so I think that helps drive people to what is perceived as remunerative rather than what their interests may be. Although I find that at Union College, which is liberal arts college, we, you know, I gave a couple of exceptions. Most parents are very supportive, especially if their child has a double major. So one perceived as more practical and then one perceived as interesting. And I've we had plenty of students who've come back and said that it was the classics half of their degree that sparked the interest of the employer when they went out and said, you know, all they wanted to talk about was ancient Rome, classics. I had one kid, he's a pol political science classics major. He got an uh, interview for an internship at the State Department, and all they wanted to talk about was a strategy along the um, border. Um, <laughs> they didn't want to talk about political science. Yes? When did you move from philosophy to Latin? Uh, what prompted it? Okay, so I was taking philosophy classes, and um, I, was t I took a course in Hegel, a German philosopher, and I was really having trouble understanding the vocabulary, so words like sublation. Um, and so I would look at them up and I'd read the etymologies of sublation to lift something up to a new level. And then I said, well, you know, I know German. Uh, so I checked out a copy of Hegel in German and I realized it was Aufheben, which in German, the English equivalent would be heave up. So Aufheben is raise a hand. So it's a simple word, just means to lift something up. But in, it has also this more specialized philosophical sense of lift up to another level, uh, thereby destroying what it was originally in the process. And I thought, yeah, well, if I had known the roots of the English word, uh, the meaning wouldn't have been as opaque to me because I would have had that continu continuum of concrete to abstract. And I found this not just in that, but also um, reading Ezra Pound, who said you weren't truly educated unless you knew Latin and Greek. And I said, well, I really not, don't understand English. I need to learn Latin and Greek before I can study philosophy because I need to know what the words mean. And then I got lost in the words and never came back. <laughs> so that's, and then, anyway. Uh, uh, discussions with archaeologists and then the such pursuits. Archaeologists? Oh, yes. Um, so, yeah, in addition to words, uh, they, they, they did have a material culture in the ancient world, and many of the remains are left. Uh, I did not see, I traveled to Greece for the first time in my life last fall. I went with 25 Union students, and we were in Athens for four months. And I saw many of the sites I'd only read about my entire career. And it occurred to me that I would have been a better teacher had I seen these things earlier, because I would have been able to put them in context. Um, so, but I will at least put, put these perspectives to use in my declining years. And um, yeah, yeah, so. We have an archaeologist on, uh, in our department, too. She digs in, uh, actually, Turkey, um, and also stuck in Greece. So I think it's an important part of the study of the ancient world, too. So you know, I think, as human beings, what defines us is our use of language. And so uh, words get us most quickly into the thoughts and feelings of other people. But to get a better sense of how they lived and worked, you need to look at the, the temples they built, the art they created, the, how they organized their cities. Um, and also put these things in historical context, too, by studying history. So it's a multifaceted approach. Did you have a favorite Latin author? Who, me? No, the author. Uh, I don't you recall. can tell us yours, too. <laughs> I don't recall her having a favorite. Oh, okay. Do you? Virgil. Virgil? OK. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think you're right. It was Virgil. Yes? Now you got over. I was also my brother, who my my next brother became a filmmaker, so I seem positively ambitious as a teacher by comparison. <laughs> and. Uh, um, when I entered high school, they told me, okay, you have to take Latin. So I, I did, you know, what did I know? Um, and of course, it was taught as a written language. We studied grammar. And I, I've been glad to know grammar. This, this has not my there. Um, and then I switched to French. And French was taught exactly the same way as we were taught to read. Mm -hmm. We weren't taught to speak at all. And I, I know that teaching modern languages like French has changed over. The emphasis is on speaking, and the kids can hardly read. But, so I'm wondering if there have been similar changes in the teaching of Latin. Well, it's a very, it's a perennial, perennially difficult question. So I began my career as a high school teacher. I taught German and Latin. And so I taught German as a spoken language. But I, I do think that having a grammatical component and being able to explain how the language works is useful. Because I think that part of what's interesting about learning a foreign language is you now have something to which you can, com you can compare your own language. So because we just immediately understand our own language, um, it's hard to separate out the different parts. But if you can say, okay, this is a preposition in this language, oh, and then you start to realize what prepositions are in your own language. Uh, I do think that a, 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 um, an oral component is important. So even um, though I was talking about using the grammar translation method, I do um, think that it's crucial to um, have students read the Latin aloud fluently, to try and form some sentences of their own, translate from English into Latin, because it's very difficult to use the language as opposed to just decipher it. So it, it, you do need to have go both ways with the language. I think, though, in Latin, it depends on how much time one has with students. So when I taught high school, I used much more oral Latin than I do today, where my time is much more is more limited. So I would I would write stories on the board and ask a lot of questions in Latin. And I thought it was very effective and it is an important part of language learning, but at the high school level I had the luxury of seeing the students five days a week for an hour a day as opposed to three times a week over the course of a 180 day school year as opposed to a college curriculum where our meetings are much less frequent and so, and we need to get more in more quickly. Um, but I think uh, so some balance between the two. So uh, le approaches that ignore grammar entirely, I don't think, are helpful. And I also don't think it's helpful to ignore the spoken aspect completely, too. But finding there's, a, of course, the famous phrase in Horace, aurea mediocritas, the golden mean. You know, finding that is always a challenge. Depends what the goals are, who the audience is, how much time one has. And at dealing with the lawyers, and I could read it, and because I could read the grammar, I knew what the guy was saying, even if he wasn't what he meant to say. Yeah. And, and so I had an attorney once ask if I'd studied law, and I said, No, what? I just can read closely, follow the clauses. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Comment on the usefulness of the uh, Latin uh, after fairly rigorous preparation. In 1962, I had the opportunity to uh, uh, go to Brazil for uh, two years. And of course, immediately an uh, immersion in learning Portuguese. And after I got past the uh, you know the initial uh, uh, understanding of the language, I suddenly discovered that all these. Um, Exotic uh, verb uh, uh, forms. The Portuguese used the Latin form, letter for letter. You know, it was uh, it was very easy for me to to pick up Portuguese from. We have a huge advantage of vocabulary and also the grammar of the verb. 
That's right. What was the verb? I... One more. You said that seventy percent of our English language is Latin. What percent of our English language is Greek? <laughs> oh well, that's. That's a good question because many of uh, the words that often are counted as Latin are words that have been transliterated first from Greek into Latin. And so, uh, especially the more complicated ones. And I've seen various statistics. I don't know who's measured this scientifically, so I just go with the statistic I have uh, encountered most frequently. I don't have a statistic for the uh, percentage that's Greek. But of course, when in scientific vo uh, vocabulary, um, much of it is exclusively Greek, but in Latin dress. <laughs> so that's a good question. I'll have to investigate it for my next talk. Well, thanks for coming. Well, thank you for having me.